All right, looks like our recording has started. So um, for those of you that uh, have logged in and are just logging in, if you haven't already done so, uh, please go ahead and check your audio. If you're experiencing any audio trouble or you do not have a headset or speakers, you can also call in by phone. And I am going to go ahead and put that into the chat. I put that call in number in there for everyone. Um, I do have a comment in the chat though. Uh, Luann wants to know if we're talking. I'm just going to say to her, yes, we started. So hopefully she can figure out her audio. Um, let her run the audio test here. Okay, let's go ahead and keep going, and I will come back to Lou Ann in um, just a minute and see if she's okay. All right. Oh, the slides are slow to change today. There we go. Okay. So uh, welcome to the fifth and final webinar of the 2018 IGNIS season. I cannot believe that we've done five webinars already and that we're um, finishing up today. It's just crazy. It's gone so fast. Um, IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite. And that's exactly what we are hoping to do today is to ignite your curiosity and to spark your intellect. This webinar series is brought to you by the Office of E-Learning and Open Education at the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. And um, you're stuck with just one host today. My co-host is out sick. Uh, Mark Carbon is usually here to help with introductions. So um, my name is Alyssa Sells, and I am the creator of this webinar series, and I've hosted the series for the last five years with various co-hosts. And I will go ahead and share out my contact information with you at the end of the webinar, so um, if you have questions about IGNIS, um, you can contact me. Okay, so our topic today is teaching students to communicate professionally. And our presenter is Ellen Bremen. And Ellen, I, my apologies, I forgot to ask you how to pronounce your last name, so hopefully I said it right. It's Bremen. But it's, it's Bremen. Really I knew it was going to be Bremen. Yeah, yes. it's totally fine. Okay, so let's do that again. Our presenter is Ellen Bremen. Okay, and I should have known because there's only one M, so I had 50-50% of chance of getting but that right. German, <laughs> Germany, so it's confusing. All right, well, I had originally have a German last name too, um, <laughs> and it was always pronounced wrong, so I, I totally get it. So a big thank you to Ellen for being here today to share her knowledge and expertise with us this afternoon. And um, we'll get to introducing Ellen here in just a minute. Um, I would like to point out that all of our webinars are live captioned. And I'll thank um, ACS for their real-time captioning services. And I'm just going to put a link to the captions if you um, want to open those and read along while you're listening. Uh, I'm going to put that into the chat for you. So feel free to open those. They do open in a separate window, just so you know. And you can also access um, the keyboard shortcuts if you need them. And I will go ahead and put that into the chat as well, just for anybody who'd rather use their keyboard than their mouse if you need to navigate around for anything. All right, so um, like all of our webinars, uh, this webinar is being recorded and you can access the recording and actually all of the recordings and all of the resources from um, all five years of our um, webinar series on the blog, but I'm gonna put the link directly to the 2018 recordings. So um, that just went into the chat and that's the, um, that's the URL that you see on to on the screen there. It's um, it's a bit.ly link. It's bit.ly slash um, ignis, I-G-N-I-S, all caps, 2018 dash recordings with a capital R. So if you need to go back and find those later, um, you can. 
So for those of you that were listening in while we before we started the recording and um, started the webinar, um, you know that we've switched web conferencing tools this year. And so we'd like to take a minute at the beginning just to get started with um, a very brief overview of the meeting interface. And then um, at that point when we're done with that, I'll go ahead and introduce Ellen to everyone. So you can find the list of participants and the participants tool in the participants panel, and that's near the top right of your screen. Um, there are little triangles um, next to the to little, the little panel, panel, and, and you, you may need, need to, to um, expand, expand or, or close, close those depending, depending on what you want to see. Um, um, I, I am getting, getting some feedback, feedback from, from someone's, someone's mic. mic. So, so uh, let, me, let just me just check, check and see here, here who I can use. Hmm. All right. All right. Just getting, getting an echo, an echo of, myself, of myself, so it's a little, a little difficult, difficult to, to talk to you. Is anyone, Is anyone else hearing, hearing the echo? No. No one, no else, one else getting, getting it at me. That's, that's weird. weird. I've never, never had that, that happen, like, like mid-introduction. Mid introduction. So, so, all right, all right. Well, I'll, I'll just um, um, try to try muddle, muddle through it, through it. so uh, uh, forgive, forgive all the awkward, awkward pauses, pauses I listen to myself, myself talk while, while I'm talking. talking. Okay, okay. Sounds, sounds like, like someone, someone else is getting, getting that echo, echo as well. well. Okay. I, I'm, I'm going to pause, pause here just a second, a second if we, if we fix, fix that. that. Okay, okay. Is, that is that better? No, no, not yet. Just just pause here. Okay, how's that? Is that better? The echo's gone away for me. Ellen, it, the echo was coming from your mic, so I'm going to leave you muted until um, we're ready to have you start, okay? Everybody good? Better. Okay, perfect. Yes, it was distracting. I see that um, comment. It's hard to, to listen to that, um, that double there. So, okay, hopefully we are back on track now. Okay, I was talking about the participants panel that's near the top right of your screen. Um, do get ready to type. Ellen has some questions for you built into her presentation, so we will be using the chat feature today. And you can also type your comments and questions into the chat panel as well. And that's near the bottom right of your screen, and you can um, type as we go if you have a question, or feel free to raise your hand to ask a question, and I'll show you where that little hand button is in just a second. Um, and also, um, if you do send a chat, I think I have it enabled correctly, um, but be sure that you're selecting everyone from the drop-down menu when you're sending a message just to make sure that it goes through to the entire group and not just to an individual person. You can access um, the WebEx help information by clicking on the help link in the menu options, and that's near the top middle of your screen. And then you can also enter a full screen view by clicking on the expand arrows near the top middle of your screen. So um, if you're having a hard time seeing the slides, because sometimes um, the windows can get kind of tiny depending on what device you're using to view the webinar, um, if you want to pop into full screen view, sometimes you can, you can see them better. Um, but you can also get stuck in full screen view. So um, to exit full screen view and get back to the full meeting interface, you can either use the escape key on your keyboard or um, you can click on the return key that's on the pop-down menu. If you just hover over the top um, area near the top of your screen, a little menu will pop down. There's a blue button that says return on it. That's your other way back to the meeting interface. All right, so the participant tools, um, additional tools, you can either raise your hand to speak and um, if you do raise your hand to speak and would like to participate um, using your microphone rather than typing into the chat, um, you'll just need to mute and unmute yourself. Um, we ask to, that you keep yourself muted when you're not speaking and that um, you just remember to unmute your mic uh, when you're ready to talk. So um, I think that's it for the getting started. 
So um, before I introduce Ellen, uh, I just like to say that I don't always get the chance to meet our presenters face to face. Our presenters come um, from all across our lovely state of Washington and occasionally we have presenters um, who join us from other states, but it's mostly um, Washington faculty and staff who present for us. Um, and I don't always get the chance to meet them, but I did have the honor and pleasure of meeting Ellen in person recently at the uh, 2018 ATL conference in Vancouver, Washington early this, earlier this month. So um, I just wanted to, to say that I had really enjoyed uh, meeting her and having lunch with her and getting to know her. So that was really um, fun for me to get to know um, a presenter that I hadn't met before. All right, so let's get to our official introduction of Ellen. Um, Ellen has taught for 17 years with an emphasis on interpersonal communication and public speaking. She has earned three national awards for her teaching innovations, and she holds degrees in both communication studies and post-secondary education. Ellen is also the author of a book called Say This, Not That, to your, college, to your professor, 36 Talking Tips for College Success. And um, for anyone that might be interested in learning a little bit more about that, I'm just going to put a link to Amazon into the chat here. And um, you can go investigate and read a little bit more about the book she wrote. Ellen is dedicated to strengthening the communication skills of her students. And Say This, Not That is her mission as a communication studies faculty at Highline College. She lives in Seattle with her husband and two children. And she's a five times a week CrossFitter, wow. And she's also a crocheter, a kayaker, and an avid television watcher. And I'm hoping that maybe she crochets while she's watching TV and maybe not while she's kayaking. So um, Ellen, thank you for joining us today. And I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you and uh, switch your slides over and I'll give you the presenter's ball and we'll turn it over to you. Excellent, thank you so much. No, I, I am not crocheting while kayaking, but now I feel like that's a challenge. I know, I, maybe you should try it. I don't know. No, that, that. No, um, <laughs> I don't know, how the, paddle, I don't know how, the paddle, how the paddle would work with that, but right. I know, that'd be funny, right? That would be, that would be a picture for sure. Well, okay, I think you're set and ready, so take it away. Okay. Excellent. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to do this. I've seen these presentations and I, I, I kept watching the deadlines and I'm just excited to be here and, w and feel that it's interesting the timeline of this topic coming at the very end of the quarter as we're all winding down and have kind of, you know, had our, possibly had our fill of, of communication interactions with students. So I'm going to skip ahead. I have an introductory slide here, but it's everything that Alyssa already said. So I want to start by sharing some excerpts with you of actual, um, these are actual sections of students' papers in one of my communication classes. They have to do a social media fast. So I want to share, these are in their words. I have not edited them in any way. So you can, you can take a look. I won't, I won't read these to you because I know that you can read them yourself, but I will, uh, I'll be tying this to, I'll be explaining why I'm sharing this in just a moment. So you can see this one and here's the next one. And another. And another. So here's what I find interesting. What we're up against, if you if you those statements, and those are those are across a diversity of students, older students, younger students, um, students of you know very genders. It's it's across the board, and these are comments that I see in these papers year after year, ever since smartphones have really become, less, well, I guess we could say a thing. It's definitely, it, it makes me think about our expectations. If those, those statements, students are telling us that they are not, there's a lot of discomfort about communicating, they don't want to make eye contact. I'm sure we've all seen this as we've, as we've been teaching, but 
we are in this environment where we have extremely high expectations for professional communication. Students say things or they behave in a way that we think is that we deem is not professional and we're right. But then what we have to realize is that in students' personal lives, they are just not, many of them are just not communicating as much. So then if they're not communicating out there, we have this expectation in here that seems almost a little bit over the top, right? It, it feels like, wow, we're expecting them to do something that they're not necessarily getting as much practice in these times. They're not getting as much practice on the outside. So in, in all of it, this next slide will not surprise you. I followed, I followed the National Association of Colleges and Employers. They do this annual study looking for the top employability skills. And a version of this is on every one of my syllabi because I teach gen ed and a gen ed course that is very anxiety producing for students. I mean, public speaking or interpersonal or our theory classes, those are, you know, they're stressful because students have to communicate. But I try to help them see that these are the skills that employers are looking for. So, I mean, it, it, it's meaningful for us to take this, to take this opportunity to teach them more, more productive communication skills. So as Alyssa said, I've been teaching for 17 years, and I know you might wonder, were things so different before smartphones? I feel that what's changed more than anything is that students are, I, I think there was definitely the same type of discomfort, but I, I feel like it's definitely changed and it's gotten worse. I mean, there are segments of my classes that always bred amazing discussion, and now there's just oh, across the board a lot more hesitation. In the earliest days of my career, which um, started back in 2000, I, you know, a student would say something like our, our very favorite, did I miss anything important today, right? And so I remember thinking, wow, you know, I'm sure we've all thought of delicious responses to that that are, you know, very satisfying for us that we would never say. But what was interesting is, is as students continue to say these, you know, unproductive things to me, I started to keep this legal pad. Remember, this is before, you know, before we, before smartphones, before um, all the, as much technology as we have. So I kept this legal pad in my desk and I would write down some of these phrases. And as the pages became increased with these, you know, same types of phrases that I would hear students say that I'm thinking, wow, why would they say that? That was what turned into say this, not that to your professor. So the bottom line is this, before we get into um, the heart of this presentation, is that, so I'm in communication, as you know, but I firmly believe that regardless of discipline, we are arm in arm on the front lines. We are the last of the front line to help students learn how to communicate properly. And I'm not talking about changing your curriculum, but I'm talking about when those times come up that we know that they are communicating in a way that is not becoming to, would not be becoming to an employer and could potentially be harmful, that often in, we, we move to solve their problem, but we never really deal with the interaction, and that's where the teachable moment is around communication. So to that end, there are three things that I wanted to focus on in our discussion today. So the first one is email communication, and then the language of responsibility, and finally, the, some of the language of our own transparency, which has an impact on students as we sort of model our own expectations. So when we think about email communication, I'm. I know that it's, it's a problem across the board for many faculty. Typically, our, you know, it used to be that our problem was that they had an unproductive email address, right? They just had something that was not, that you know, you're thinking, wow, this is what you came up with. This, this is what used to be our problem. But now it is more, you know, the content of the content of their email and how they don't realize that how they're communicating via email can be problematic. Also, what I think students absolutely don't realize is that especially, and I especially find this when students, uh, you know, are not checking their email based on, you know, class uh, 
canvas or whatever and you know they say oh i just didn't check they just don't realize how pervasive email still is in private industry they don't realize that every email exchange with us every back and forth attached document every discussion forum post this is all demonstrative practice for their ability to professionally communicate so these are again some excerpts of emails that I've received, and this is this one is literally exactly in response to, a, you know, the student had asked me a question, I about a grade, I had given them some clarification, I did have a greeting in my email, I did have a close, a signature line, but this is what came back to me, you know, so that right, I mean, I'm I'm sure you've seen similar, you know. Maybe you've seen similar things. Or this one came in, again, exactly like this from a different person. And then this one. And yet another. So I'm going to share in just a moment some an assignment that I've created around professional email. But before I do, I'd like to hear about some email blunders that you experience. What experiences do you have with your students with email? So go ahead and either raise your hand and we will have you respond verbally or feel free to uh, type your comments in response to Ellen's question into the chat. So it looks like we've had a few uh, people comment, Ellen. Um, someone said, well, Luann says that she just received one of the messages that you showed. Um, <laughs> Thank you, student. Student. Um, she just <laughs> recently received that. Um, Mary says lack of greetings. Carolyn said they address her with hey. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good one. Um, that's a good one. Mary also says, um, lack of use of the subject line. I know that one personally drives me crazy because the student will start talking about whatever it is and you're like, what is the topic? What are we talking about? Um, <laughs> so, um, hey, I just want to know what I missed in class is another one that came in from Elise. And um, something important, clearly. Yes, very important. I've had I've fielded that question many times in my teaching. I'm like, well, it's all important. You miss the entire class. Exactly. Um, and Luann also says that many of the emails are not coherent or are riddled with grammar errors, um, and that's coming from her um, business English students. So um, that looks like oh, there's a couple other ones. Um, but uh, Luann teaches using subject lines, and um, Tim has contributed that he perceives passive aggressive communication in many instances of fire ready aim. So that's what's come into the chat so far. I, as far as the passive aggressive communication, it really, I just marvel that, you know, similar to the examples that I just showed, I, you know, if we were in person or even on the phone, it, it would never, you know, I want to believe that it would never escalate to that point. And, you know, it, it's easy. It shuts us down. And I, I see, I don't always know what the abbreviations mean. I totally agree because in te I, I text a lot, but I don't use abbreviations. I don't, I don't either. My kids drive me, they, they say, Mom, you're driving us crazy. You're typing in full sentences in text. <laughs> right, exactly. So, I mean, and also, do you find lack of, spec you know, lack of specificity? So I just received an email from a student. It was just yesterday. And they said, you know, basically that that they need help well i mean can we you know can we narrow that down to a theme <laughs> something some give me something else and then it takes three emails to get out of them what they actually need help with so i have a response for that that i will that i'll discuss but first i will show you this assignment that i've that I've adapted. So to make sure that I'm giving credit where credit is due, this assignment was borrowed from three of my colleagues in the English department. I will go back. All right. So 
I remember seeing this document, this professional email format that my uh, my colleagues in English had started, and I loved it. I thought, this is great. This gives them an exact format to write emails to me. And I, but then I, I'm kind of surprised I didn't connect this. You know, I still received the same types of emails. Well, then in fall, I had done a presentation, I, I'd done a presentation for the Health Sciences Division of Bellevue College. And we were talking about this very subject of email. And I had this revelation that I needed to, the only way they are going to follow this is if I create an assignment around it. I don't know why that was so revolutionary to me after 17 years, but, but all right, I need an assignment around this where they're forced to do it. So I'll show you the assignment that I've created. So, in each of my classes, this is a little bit different. It depends on what I want the students to tell me, what I want them to tell me when they are sending me this email. So what I do in Canvas, this is their very first assignment in the class, and it's literally due within, I don't know, 48, 72 hours. It's due the first week, and it's very, I, I throw five points on it because we all know that if you don't throw some points, they probably won't do it, or most of them won't do it. So they first have to read the professional email format document that I just showed you, and then they have to tell me the following. They've read the syllabus. This one is for my, my public speaking, my online public speaking class. So not only am I asking them to read the recording requirements, which so many of them don't, but they have to cite something specific. I need to know that they've read it so thoroughly that they will cite number 13 and that they agree to the five-person audience requirement. I want to know how they will plan for the requirement. And this is a great thing for me. It's not only getting them to practice this professional email format and to give them points for that, but also to identify that they have a plan for this online class. And again, the flavor of this is a little different with every class that I, with every class I teach. I don't teach all online but this one just happens to be for the online course. So then I decided, you know, with this email problem that I'm having, that students will say, oh, I just didn't see your email. Then I ask them to tell me that they've set a text alert from Canvas or they've established some other email um, forward from something that they will check. And then I want them to let me know if they have any questions or let me know if they have any concerns. So, you know, has this created of all perfect emails, no, it hasn't, but it sets up an expectation where I feel that now I have more gravity if they do send me an unprofessional email in format or in content, and I'll talk a little bit about the content in, in a few minutes, um, a statement that I have about the unprofessional content in my syllabus that I've devised. This allow this opens that door for me to say something about it and say, you know, remember that professional email format assignment that we did? And I'm really, I'm pleased with the way, you know, throwing silly five points to it has made, you know, it, I feel like it has definitely made a difference and it gives me some early connection with them and gives them the early expectation. So, all right, so moving forward, the next section is the language of responsibility. I know that we, many of us struggle with this idea of students, you know, the whole, I, I missed last Thursday, what do I need to do? Or, you know, emailing you or, or contacting you for help when it's way too late, for, you know, right before an assignment is due. This is, again, this is that, you know, I mean, I'm sure you feel the same way that I do. If these students did these same things at work, it, I mean, it would mean something disastrous. Or if any of us did, did this at work, you know, if we went before, a, before we had something due to a dean or vice president, if we said, oh, you know, it's, it's due tomorrow. Oh, you know, can you help me with that? Or, I mean, it's, what would that look like for us? And I, I realize that these are developmental skills for our students, but again, it's that, teaching them the right things to say. So I had a student who constantly was emailing me 30 minutes before an assignment was due. And just to give some context, 
My assignments are due at 11.59 p.m., but I have changed my policy where the Dropbox stays open unpenalized until 5 a.m. the next morning. And a colleague of mine said, well, why don't you just have a deadline be 5 a.m.? And I'm like, well, then I'm going to have to, you know, like, if they have this, this sort of idea that they're getting a buffer, and for those that do like to work at night, it has saved me from waking up to 87 problem emails with technology issues or whatever. I now get barely any because they know that they have that window to figure things out. I don't know if it's any kind of magic anything, but I do know that it's cut down the number of emails that I wake up to with crises. However, I had the student constantly emailing me like a half hour ahead of time. And as you can imagine, the work definitely showed that because there was no time to give that student help when the assignment was due. So I have a statement in my syllabus, for example, of what my early review policy will be, you know, that I, I will, I'll do it through email, but it has to be at least um, 48 to 72 hours ahead of time. So what was interesting is the student actually missed an assignment, came to my office very upset because it's the zero really dropped their grade. And, you know, as I came to find out, the student had said, I said, you know, I, I understand that you are concerned about this grade. No question. I, I get it. And you're concerned about your average. But I really want to talk about the overall, the overall communication here that, you know, when you're sending me an email a half hour before it's due, number one, I may not be awake. And number two, that's not really enough time for you to, even if I gave you the help, it's not really enough time for you to implement it. So what is the pattern here? What is, what's happening that's in the bigger picture? And the student just kept focusing on the grade, but I have a terrible grade, I'm gonna get in so much trouble. And I said, but what is the, where, what's the pattern? So, you know, the student told me that they were play, they play basketball in the afternoons, and not on a team, but just like, rec, you know, just like for fun. And then they fall asleep and then wake up and realize that the assignment is due. So, you know, I appreciated, I definitely, appreciated the honesty, but, you know, there's, there's this issue of, again, this idea of what that sounds like. I mean, could any of us say that to our superiors? I mean, that, that, again, just that lack of conception that how this is coming across. So these are some of the things that I've been just working with with students. So first of all, to be selfish, and that's what I told that student. Be selfish in the best sense of the word, meaning that you deserve to have help. You're in college. You're not meant to know everything about everything. It's my job to help you, but be selfish about the timeline when you ask for that help and do it early enough where you can actually benefit from it. Care about your own stress, because when you're constantly backing up against a deadline, then, you know, that is extremely stressful and you deserve more peace than that. I also, it, and this is in my syllabus, this is all in my syllabus, if I, I literally give them the words to ask me for help, you know, tell me what you've already done. So like the email that I received where the student said, I need help, and there was nothing else there to, to tell me. Tell me, you know, that's a place of helplessness. That's a place of vulnerability. Just, you know, throwing up your hands and saying, I'm, you know, oh, I, I just don't get it. But when you can say to me, I've read through the persuasive speech assignment, I am stuck on the opposition. This gives me the place where, you know, this gives me a place to work with, and it gives me a place to help you, and it also makes, will give you this feeling of, you know, rather than feeling so, you know, lost and helpless, it tells me you're sending the message that you've done something for yourself. So you've at least done something to try, but just saying, I'm so lost, I don't understand, I need help. I mean, this is why students are afraid to ask for help, because they feel vulnerable and they feel embarrassed. But if you say what you've already done, it gives you a little, you know, some more credibility. And what is your concrete plan? So, you know, when students come to me and say, I, you know, I missed a week or I missed this or I missed that, I say, well, what's your proposal? Tell me what your plan is. Because they want to just throw it on our laps, but the language of responsibility is, here's what I'm going to do. I mean, if we were going to be late with something in our jobs, 
you know, I mean, I'm sure we aren't, but right, because I mean, we've been through all of this, been through school and we're professionals, but if it were to happen, we would go in with a plan, you know, this, this is my plan, this is how I'm going to, this is how I'm going to rectify the situation. And, you know, also teaching students to discuss where they've missed them, where have you missed the mark? Like, where do you feel you, where was the, the, the sticking point? Where was the hiccup? You know, what did you get to first? And then all of a sudden it was like, whoa, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not there anymore. And I, and I, I could use help. I could use guidance as, you know, to figure that out. And then what are the specific issues? Again, that just rather than the generalities, what are the specific issues that you're dealing with with this assignment? What are the specific issues you have with this exam? Or, you know, what are the specific issues that are hindering you from asking for help earlier? You know, similar to the student that who was, um, you know, similar to that the student that I mentioned who was not asking for help in any kind of a timely manner, and it happens all the time. So I don't think that this, I'm trying to advance my slides here. There we go. So a colleague of mine, when we were talking about late, you know, work that's late and such, I, I just struggled for so many years with policies and, le you know, being lenient and being very, you know, having zero tolerance policy. I just have gone back and forth and back and forth with the professional, again, the professional communication around some of these issues. And a colleague of mine sent me this um, brief. It's, you know, it's, it's dated, but I have to believe that it's no different now. And this is reasons why new college graduates either don't uh, keep their jobs or they don't get promoted. And I look at so many of these and I see, I just, I see repetitively the issues that we face in classes. So just to underscore that these are the, you know, these are the times for the teachable moments, regardless of our discipline. I've just come to believe that these soft skills and especially around communication and also having, you know, giving students the reality of the message that is sent by not asking for help in time, by the lateness. Some of the, again, unproductive things that they do, there's a message around that and the, that message can have an impact. So now my next question for you, just generally, what are, what are some other ways we can teach students how to communicate responsibility or what, what thoughts do you have around you know, this perpetual lack of responsible language. So go ahead and type your responses into the chat like last time, or feel free to raise your hand and we will call on you and you can share your comment uh, using your mic. Either way works. All right, so Mary, Mary Russell says, have them imagine or practice how they will interact with others in their future profession. So I have something really, really scary to share about that. So I have a colleague who's teaching interpersonal communication right now, and she um, has just been flabbergasted because she does a lot of professional communication in there, in that class. And she said that several students have literally not connected how some of these topics, conflict management, et cetera, relate to their future. There's, there's that disconnect of how, of, you know, how does this relate to me? She did even a midterm, um, a midterm evaluation and that had come up and she was just, her mind was just blown. So I, I definitely feel, I totally agree. We have to figure out how do we keep reminding them that these, this is the training ground and then establish rubrics for discussion forum posts which address professional communication. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just these continued reminders of, of these interactions. Because they don't connect that discussion forum dialogue, it's still the same, you know, it's dialogue that could happen on email or in another meet electronic medium. And modeling good communication skills ourselves. I have, um, I'm going to share something about that with the language of transparency in just a minute. And it's, in, it's evolving all the time, even for me. Create writing assignments with rubrics that address subjects, lines, message, and professional interactions. 
definitely. And I feel like if I can find a way, I'd actually like to bring that professional email format assignment. I, I'd like to, you know, circle that loop around again at other points in the quarter. So that way it, it's a continued reminder. Netiquette statements, absolutely. That's a big quality matters thing for those of you who are familiar with quality matters, the um, nonprofit organization with uh, best practices of online learning always, you know, that's one of the, their standards is netiquette statements. Thanks for the QM plug, Ellen. I know. Well, you know, because I'm the QM. lead coordinator for the state, so if you have quality matters questions, I am the person to ask. I love, I love quality matters. Me too. All right. So the very last section here is this language of transparency, and I feel more than, more than anything, I feel that the language of transparency starts with me, similar to the the comment about modeling good communication skills ourselves. And I think this is just that constant self-check of how, you know, how are we communicating? So I created a, a um, I have a lot about communication in my syllabus. So the very first thing is I'm extremely transparent about the um, process of communicating with me. So, you know, when, what my window is to respond, if I can respond on weekends, please don't email me 15 times if I don't get back to you in five minutes. Uh, if you don't receive an email from me, here's what to do. And then the very important, I will only discuss student business through official campus channels, um, not social media. And just for the record, I also will not connect with students on LinkedIn or on Facebook while they are my student. I have, I've always had firm rules for myself around that just because I, I fear that the lines would be blurred on, you know, students would be mess messaging me about questions and then if a problem arose, I don't, I would never want to get in trouble because I, you know, because I communicated in an, in an external channel. So I also have an expectation of their commitment, which means that they have to um, assign a forward that how often I expect them to check email. And, you know, I hear it all the time. I didn't get your email. Sorry, I haven't been checking my email. And then, you know, it's basically my problem that they didn't, that they missed something. They missed something that I sent or, and I, I'm very, whether my students are face to face with me or they're online, I send emails often. I just feel that, you know, it's, it's important. So, oh, I saw a comment, great advice on using official channels. I'm, I just feel like that, I would, I'd get burned by that if I wasn't careful. I just feel like I would. So I just keep it really clean during the time that they're my student. And then, you know, after, afterwards, that's a, that could be a different story. So I created this personal manifesto a while back and it, it's in my syllabus toward the end. And basically it gives me the, you know, they're expecting to learn communication for me. That's what I do. Right. But it gives me the, it gives me the opportunity to say to them, listen, you know, even if we're not learning about, I don't know, even if we're not learning about a particular aspect of, of you know, this, even if we're not learning, you know, even if we're learning public speaking, but yet you communicate with me unprofessionally, I reserve the right to, I reserve the right to discuss that with you. You know, similar to those excerpts that you saw of the emails, like, in addition to solving the immediate problem, this is where I feel like it's so critical for all of us to circle back and say, you know, once the problem solves and say, hey, you know, if this, if this were to happen in the workplace, this, you might want to consider approaching this in a different way. And some students are really, they can get really taken aback by that because they feel in, embarrassed or they feel like you're calling them out. But my goodness, I mean, if we don't tell them, who will? So I decided to put this, you know, my syllabus is like 350 pages long. I'm kidding, but it is, you know, I, I won't lie. It's kind of lengthy. Um, I have this in there that I have, I want to focus on all of their communication skills. And I think any of us can do this. So there was a question from Luann, does this apply to bad grammar usage in an email? I think that it can apply to literally anything. If we comment on that, we are helping them in this training ground in here for what they will have to do out there. Because I just fear if we don't tell them who will, and we're 
who else will tell them? I just don't know who else would do that. So this is the rest of, um, yeah, so that's, that's my manifesto. And I just, uh, something else that I wanted to circle back on. And I also have, a, as you see, I also have a statement in there about myself. If you feel that, you know, I mean, I, I strive not to be disrespectful. I strive to be kind and whatever. But if I, you know, come across in a way that's uncomfortable for you, then please, then I, you, you know, you can tell me about that. So I want them to see that this goes two ways. So the last thing that I wanted to share is, you know, based on transparency, I, I am, I do not allow extra credit ever. I, I really feel that the, um, I philosophically, I have felt that, you know, in the workplace, you can't get a bad review and then suddenly say, you know, well, oh, at the last minute, oh, what can I do to solve this? that, you know, we should excel, uh, you know, within our degree of mastery, if you will, we should excel at the work that we already have to do. And for students, I really want to emphasize to them that, you know, focus your attention on the work that you have. Don't just say, oh, I will, you know, if this doesn't, if this doesn't go well, let me just do extra credit. Or, you know, is there anything else I can do? So what I have thought of that, that feels better to me is this assignment called the feedback loop. I believe, and I'm sure you'd agree, that in the workplace, when we have feedback and we have suggestions for how to improve our work, we are expected to act upon that feedback or at least respond to it in some way, right? So, I mean, you know, when my vice president said, oh, Ellen, when you submit your next post-tenure package, you know, it would be good if you could do this, I'm certainly going to heed that advice. So we're giving feedback all the time. And one of the things that really I really struggled with is that, so let's take my public speaking class. I give tons and tons of feedback on an informative or persuasive speech and that, or on the outline, that outline scaffolds to them getting up and delivering the speech. And I realized that, my gosh, they're not even, you know, they know that there will be an impact a grade impact, the speech is a separate grade, but my gosh, I'm spending all this time and they are not even, you know, they're not even taking the advice. So now, you know, instead of any kind of extra credit and students don't know when this assignment is coming because we both know that they will not give their best effort the first time if they do, but this is the feedback loop assignment. So they have to look at my exact feedback that I have given them. And what they need to do is either fill out this table or they can use the other alternate format below. I want them to, on the um, furthest column from the left, I want them to tell me what was the feedback verbatim that I gave them. And then I want to know the changes that they made, and I want to know where those changes are located. So I feel that this has given me, um, it, it's given me this, altern this alternative situation to A, teach them how important it is to communicate your response to feedback and to suggestions and to react and revise. This has made so much more sense to me. Now, I only do this with high stakes assignments. And again, they don't know, they don't know when it will, they don't, you know, after the first time, it only comes one more time and they don't know when it's coming. But from a professional perspective of teaching them this critical skill, because we've all passed documents back and forth with each other, right? And, you know, tell me, what do you think about this conference presentation proposal or whatever? You know, how does my promotion package look? We do it all the time and we, we respect each other's feedback and we act on it. And I just feel like this has been a, this, this has been a great assignment. And also as a byproduct, there, you know, the, the, their speeches, their final work has improved so much because I'm forcing the communication around, around revision. So again, another part of transparency is um, for me saying, you know, no, I won't do extra credit. And there was a comment that um, the feedback loop assignment looks like a well-delineated alternative to extra credit. So I'll tell you how I handle the grading on this. This is worth zero points which I know you're like, what? But it, it, I will go back and I will add points to the, original, uh, to the original assignment. So that's how I handle it. I didn't know, I just didn't know how to grade, how to assign points to this independently. And that made mo more sense. 
Now, likewise, if they choose not to do this assignment, then the, the assignment that it's scaffolds to, in my case, the, you know, their speech, actual speech, will start at a lower threshold because they didn't do this. So it's worth zero points, but, it, but I will put points back on the, say, their outline. And it can, you know, it can't go to perfection. I tell them, you know, it's not going to go to 100%, but you can earn a significant, based on the changes you've made, it, you can earn a significant amount back. And I have really, really liked this a lot. And it feels better to me than any kind of extra credit I could have ever offered. So I noticed um, we have like nine more minutes. And my last question is about transparency in your communication with students. What advice do you have? What, and also, you know, if you have any thoughts of for my, you know, speaking of suggestions, if you have anything on the, any of the documents that I've shown you, please, I would, I love new ideas. Or any of your, you know, if you have alternate thoughts on them, I'd love it. So. All right, go ahead and type any comments you might have or answers to Ellen's question here uh, into the chat. Or feel free, again, to raise your hand if you'd like to participate using your mic. And we'll just call on you if you raise your hand. Everyone's so quiet. So if this, if this question, um, in al an alternative to this question also is just, you know, what communication issues are you struggling, are you struggling with um, yourselves? I know there are typically many for us, right? Because of this work that we do. Luann says, I can improve on my transparency after hearing your comments. You know, I always feel like, I, I feel the same. I, I always, it's a work in progress. And I, I feel like, you know, when you lay your cards out on the table, that's, I mean, who can argue if you're just laying your cards out on the table and say, here's why I'm doing this. And that's, I, I, with all of these things, I just am very honest with them. I likewise include a communication expectation syllabus section in my course syllabi. I'd love to see that. Yeah, this is a really tough question, I think, Ellen. It, it requires some thought. I don't know if I've ever thought about my communication um, in regards to, like, intentional transparency. I mean, I think I do have transparency built in, but I don't know if I've ever, um, you know, really stopped to think about it. I mean, I think it's kind of there just because that's the kind of teacher I am and uh, because I follow, um, you know, a lot in the QM rubric. So, I mean, I do have those netiquette sections built in. Um, I do have, um, you know, specific communication guidelines and policies and things built in, and I try to be very, very clear about those. But um, I haven't gone as far as posting, like, a manifesto for my students or anything, but I, I do, I did really, really love that idea. So, um, yeah, I find this question to be kind of difficult to answer. Yeah, it is. And so May says, I teach math and wonder what approach to take when responding to a poorly written email. Well, would you consider that professional email format assignment at the very beginning? Again, I know some of these things I'm showing, they're like, well, they make sense in a communication class, but sometimes they may not feel, it may feel, you know, a little bit forced in other types of classes. But I think that, I think, I, I believe that, again, we're all arm in arm, we're all together. So that's, I mean, it gives the license then for us to say, when we receive a poorly written email, I'd, I'd like you to circle back. Yeah, I'd like you to circle back to that professional email format. Now, I will tell you that in the English department, the folks that uh, created that original professional email assignment, some of them literally they will respond to the student and say, "I will not, I will not respond to this email until or until it's in professional email format, or please resend in professional email format." The um, the issue for me with that is I feel like, oh my gosh, it's going to take 10 times as long to deal with their problem. So I haven't gotten to that, but I, I want, I wish I could get to that. So Mary says, I also have communication expectations written in the syllabus about speaking only for oneself and using professional language such as women and men rather than guys. I love that. I need to add that in. I love that. 
it's all, it's just, it's all a work in progress. I, I mean, just when I think I, you know, okay, I have a lot of, you know, I have a lot of things that I have in place, then there are new things that I realize, oh, you know, I should have more, more transparency or more, you know, it's, it's just constant. Carolyn says, this has been good, awesome. I teach dental hygiene students and this will help prepare them for their professional communication by starting now. And I always, and, you know, when I wrote my book, I, in it, I talk about, you know, let them mess up here with us in a place where it's, you know, the stakes are high, but they're not as high as, you know, if you, if you have these same behaviors at work, let, let us be the, let us be the, the training ground where you have a little bit of room to mess up, but then you, you know, you learn how to say it correctly. Ooh, Ellen, there's a really great question in there from Mary. She says, um, do you have suggestions about how this could be approached college-wide rather than just in our individual courses? Well, you know, I have done many a seminar, and you could too. Uh, exactly. I was going to say during opening week, I've done, um, you know, so you could absolutely do offer to put something together during opening week. Any kind of new faculty um, programs, seminars, professional development day. I mean, if you have some, some things, or even just have, you know, even just um, like we used to do these, um, you know, these lunch and learn type things through our learning and teaching center. Anything about student professor communication, it's one of the underserved topics. I mean, literally, that was when I wrote, when I wrote the book, I went to the college success section in, you know, several major bookstores at the time, and there were more than there are now, and you don't find anything about this topic. And then the only time it comes up between us as colleagues is where, you know, you pass by someone and then a student just said something that upset you or that frustrated you and you're like, I can't believe what the student just said, but we don't talk about it in that same way. Excuse me. So I feel like definitely during, you know, all campus type of events, this topic of, and, you know, even stat, there's often it, we struggle with the, with the opening weeks and the professional development days because of um, st including staff. Anybody could come to something like this, faculty or staff, because we all interact with students and we can all teach, help teach them. Luann says, I teach a lesson on PC with instructors to our college success classes. <sighs> Thank goodness for you. Because, <laughs> right, I mean, they don't learn otherwise. They just don't learn otherwise. So it's, it's, it's up to us. It's just absolutely up to us to be the ones to, regardless of our discipline, to, um, to, share, to work on these skills and to let them know why we're doing it. You know, I want you to be successful. I want you to be employable. I want you to, I want to make sure that you communicate effectively and in a way that is, you know, a way that works for you in the workplace. I mean, better that they have those hard conversations with us than, you know, with someone who can affect their livelihood. Uh, Mary says maybe too we could ask our librarians to have several copies of the book prominently displayed in our libraries or other display cases. Yep, that's a great idea. Well, it's um, I, ironically, the book is going to be going into third um, revision. I'll be working on that this summer, and I'm going to be at right now. It has in, it ha each chapter also has an industry perspective. Um, so I take I I went to folks in various industries and asked them, you know, if if an employee asked you for extra, you know, for the equivalent of extra credit during a performance review, or if an employer, or if an employee was perpetually late, how do you handle that? And I got people across all industries. But for the next revision, I wanted to add other faculty points of view. So I'm glad to see who all's here because I can tap you for some some of your own opinions, which would be lovely. Because I think that um, you know, we all have these experiences and we all have these situations. So having more voices is very, um, it's just powerful and important to me. 
So Alyssa, are we, I see we're at, how, where are, how are we doing? Yep, we're just um, about out of time. So um, if there aren't any more questions for Ellen, I'm just gonna go ahead and wrap us up and close us out. We might run over like 60 seconds or something, but that's all right. Um, feel free, though, to go ahead and um, type any remaining questions you have in the chat. And if there are some questions after we close out, we'd be happy to hang out for just a minute and answer those. And um, Ellen, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and put your email address into the chat for Ellen, everyone. So um, you can contact Ellen directly um, at E. Bremen, that's E B R E M E N at Highline.edu. And um, well, this is it for this season. Um, we're done for 2018. And um, you can join us again next spring. We'll start, um, we start usually around mid March. And um, I never know what we're going to be presenting until we get our proposals in. There's so much fabulous fabulous work going on in our system. So um, I would encourage you, if you're interested um, in being a presenter for us, either contact me or just watch for that call for proposals to go out. And that usually goes out kind of late fall, um, October, early November-ish, and it stays open for several months. Um, and we're always looking for great presenters. And here's my contact information if you have any questions for me. And I'll just go ahead and um, also type my um, email address into the chat. It's a cells, that's A-S-E-L-L-S -L -L at sbctc.edu. Feel free to reach out with Ignis questions at any time. And um, the recording will get posted in anywhere from seven to 10 days. I do need to send it out for captioning. So you can look for that. And um, I'll also be posting the handouts for Ellen's assignments that she showed you um, during um, during her presentation. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Um, thank you also to Ellen. Really, really, really appreciate you being here and helping us close out the season. Um, and with that, I'm going to bid you all adieu, and I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording. <laughs>